Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Timothy Gager, and this is Virtual Fridays to our literary series. We're back after a week off, and tonight our feature and guest is uh, Robin McLean. And uh, we'll just go over. I feel like I'm, I'm teaching school here. Um, let's go over. Our, hi, boys and girls. Let's go over and check out this page of this is Robin McLean's uh, website. And if you, of course, if you uh, want to find out more about her, it's robinmclean.net. But, you know, basically here is her bio. She worked as a lawyer, then a potter in the woods of Alaska before turning to, to writing. Her first story collection, Reptile House, won the 2013 BOA Editions Fiction Prize and twice finalist for Flannery O'Connell Short Story Prize. Her debut novel, Pity the Beast, was released uh, last fall, early winter, to fabulous reviews and accolades. Um, and it was best book of fiction of the year, named by The Guardian, The Wall Street Journal, and The White Review. And her second story collection is coming out this year, uh, Get Them Young, Treat Them Tough, Tell Them Nothing. And coincidentally, when that book is released, will be the same day as the paperback version of Pity the Beast. So. Um, with at that, I'm going to turn it on over to uh, Robin, and uh, well, welcome. Hey, Tim. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to uh, join your exalted uh, list of people who have read on your show and to visit Boston via the internet. <laughs> so um, I'm going to read from my novel, Pity the Beast. It, when I was working on it, uh, I thought of it as a Western. I wrote it mostly in the desert in the West. Um, it's, uh, it's also, I would call it a feminist Western because it's got three really, really badass women sort of running the show. And there's a lot of men who are sort of typical Western genre men, but the women are kind of running things in this book. It's also been called an eco-feminist Western because like the creatures and the landscapes that are usually background in Westerns are not background in the story. Um, it's a, a story with an initiating event that takes a long time, a very violent event where this community of people that sort of like each other are really mad at this woman, Ginny, who cheated on her husband. And there's a, a, a very violent sexual act. She's thrown into a cow pit and left for dead and she escapes into the mountains which starts the whole book because a bunch of her friends and family chase her off into the mountains to keep her quiet or get her back they all sort of have different reasons for going after her she's pretty pissed and she's really really pissed at her sister um so i'm going to read from a section where the hunt for her she sort of turns around and is actually hunting for her sister who's in a tent um this section starts with um, her remembering her grandmother, who's a total badass Western woman, who she remembers her grandmother's words of advice for a hunter, a marksman, as she's waiting to do some revenge on her sister. I'm gonna read from here, um, which will take me a little bit. And then I'm gonna read another section before we get talking. But thank you so much for having me. And here we go. Granny had told her dear ones, to miss the buck warns the whole herd. That's bad enough. The marksman may get no second shot. The herd will run. They know the mountains well and the marksman will walk and walk in endless overlapping tracks and his hunger will grow. To miss the bear is another thing. The bear won't take it well. He may run and he may not run. If he's injured, he may escape to his cave and lick his wounds, or he may follow the marksman. For a bear, boot tracks are big and clumsy, easy as pie. For a bear, the marksman reeks to high heaven. He doesn't follow the marksman for tit for tat, my little sluts. He follows out of practicality. If he has an enemy, he must subdue the enemy if he's able. In short, you get one good shot, make it sing. No time for nerves, self-doubt, or sympathy for the beast. 
The marksman must know his target well, his habits, fears, and predilections. Their camp huddled in a thick stand of aspen at a three creek confluence. High above, Ginny wolfed the latest loaf, her bowels pressed for relief. Why not let them go? The cliffs were blue gold in the waxing moon. She crouched on a terrace. The creeks wove around the stand and joined below it. She was cold, but she'd been colder. The trees were scarred by lightning, black gashes that oozed and shone. The posse's gear was a white mountain. Hard to get one good shot through the branches. The cob was safe and over the ridge tied up at a spring. The saddle had steamed as she pulled it off and she'd warmed her hands against the cob's back. She'd left the umbrella, left the red dog tied to the same cottonwood muzzled them with a boot string, though she was wrong to, for what if she didn't return? Her cunt thobbed still but less. It burned to piss. One knee was sore on both shoulders, her head. The tent below was cloth zipped up, a closed container like her cunt that like her cunt opened from time to time. The 3030 hovered on the tent's top pole. Granny would have said this of cunts. Cunts are made for using, cunts run everything. Mighty men bow to the mightier cunt. It was true and not true. The three creeks were silver lines joining. The moon faded the stars nearby. The coyote yipped on the ridge. The 3030 shifted to the coyote, then back to the top pole. Her throat ached. She'd see bruises if she ever found a mirror. At night, side vision is superior. To say she saw movement beyond the far creek would be misleading. Peripheral vision sees until the eyeballs shift to the center of the object, thereby losing the object in their direct glare. She didn't move her eyeballs. Her one good eye beamed down the barrel through the slot on the site at the tent, a noise. The ear was aimed to conclusion. Something large was moving clumsily beyond the far creek, an elk maybe, a bear. Vegetation rippled at the edge of things. Unable to resist, her eyeball shifted since humans are devout to line of sight. They think eyes belong punched to the front of the head, whereas a horse knows it pays sometimes to be mistress of your periphery. But Jenny wasn't a horse yet. She had time. She was waiting for Ella. So the 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 story goes on there it's sort of a uh out of the frying pan into the fire sort of story and everything keeps going wrong the things that happen in a western you know you ride out into the mountains and these capable cowboys know what to do but everything kind of keeps going wrong and one of the the cowboys is named Saul and he's sort of the leader of the group very much sort of a John Wayne character who's very capable very wise and things just keep screwing up and he gets real frustrated towards the end of the book and there's a lot of advice dispensed in this book and I'm going to read a short section of of Saul's advice to the group sort of a pep talk to in the western mode um, and here it is, and Ella is his wife, so you'll hear her mentioned. In short, as I've told Ella, when your life gets all confused, off kilter, and you know you got nothing to be proud of, mistakes were made, well, step back from the small. For example, we think we see mountains all around us now, don't we? Those peaks seem so solid, the most real, most immovable objects you can observe or think about in a lifetime. Well, that notion I now see is a lie. Instead of still and solid, those mountains are purest action, crystalline fluid movement. True, they are visible, solid surface, but they're also proof of faults intersecting far below 
reflecting only the smallest hint of the tumult. The titanic subsurface battles that dwarf any human action, idea, existence. It's a matter of scale and vision. Bowman is big on this. What I think is, to God, a mountain is a liquid wave that breaks over 10 million years, not a tenth of one of his seconds. Can you see the wave now? Not stone at all. The trick to peace of mind, to heaven on earth, to surviving suffering is to see the mountain as God would. Molten rock caught in an illusion of stillness by the limits of the human retina. I'm trying to say think big in times of crisis, just when your mind wants to cave in. Move past what you think you can't move past, then think bigger, expand, look onward to the grand scale. So that's it, that should be about it. I have more if you want mule thoughts, if you want <laughs> mule thoughts later. Right, that was wonderful. And the book sounds absolutely uh, incredible. Um, so uh, I've got a few things. I'm not gonna really say that I researched you all that much, but I read your bio, which gives me a lot to question. So it said that you were a lawyer before you were a potter and then you got more serious about writing. Do you still practice law? And if you don't, when did that stop? So I went to law school uh, which I hated from the first moment. Um, I, when I went in there, I thought that a tort was a little cake. I didn't know what to do. I'm like, torts, what are those? It's a class, you know, a whole area of law. I was so dumb and young. And um, so, but I finished and I went to Alaska and I clerked for a judge up there and I started taking pottery lessons and I quit my law job almost immediately, but I had taken the bar in Illinois. Um, and uh, yeah, so I went, I, I have never practiced law, but I got involved in a lot of environmental or community um, activities in Alaska. And I feel like it was a quite a good education, but not a functional one for me. It was totally a round, round peg in a square hole kind of thing. Well, you seem to have settled in a lot of cold weather-ish places. <laughs> now, can you... Uh attribute that to your start as a figure skater is that you were figure skating as soon as you were walking pretty much were you pushed into that I mean I'm not gonna be I'm not accusing anything of anything but like uh how far did you get in your figure skating career um well I skated I cannot remember not being able to skate my dad froze our our courtyard in the apartment building that we lived in Chicago when when we when I was a baby and so the minute we and we could walk we learned to skate um and i competed all the way through high school but then i thought okay well a skating life is not a super awesome life <laughs> you know it's 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 i don't know i've had such weird careers and i have a crazy resume sort of um but yeah so i i just i did a lot of competing and i Back then you did these school figure tests and learned figure eights and all that stuff, which but they don't do that anymore. But I, I tend to think that my skating life really defined how I operate in the world. Um, sort of a solitary practicing, 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 wipe out, mess up, keep trying. And then you get this, well, in the case of skating, sort of an ecstatic experience from jumping, spinning, these these physical, the physics of skating is such an incredible feeling and that you get that payoff at the end if you fall on your ass enough times. <laughs> but I don't know if that has something to do with the cold. I like cold places. I like snow. I like winter. Um, I live in Nevada now, but I live at 7,000 feet elevation. So it's quite, it's, it's pretty cold here now anyway. I'm not in, I'm not there. I'm in Reno, but it's chilly here today too. It snowed last night. It sounds though that skating is a lot like riding. You know, you fall on you, you fall on your ass, and then you pick yourself up, and you reach some level of exhilaration and acceptance. But you know, there's a lot of rejection in the riding world as well. Yeah, you have to, um, you have to suffer. <laughs> you have to get a lot of rejections, and you have to pretty much do it 
because you want to do it because there's no guarantee how all of this stuff is gonna if it's ever going to reach some some complete the circuit of meeting a a reader you know in that space that we all seek to meet the reader um which i've been pretty lucky with that and i'm really really grateful about that do you think of uh the reader or the audience before you write the book or during the writing of the book i really don't i i don't really i mean um I try not to because uh, I, I mean, at some point, especially in the editorial process, you have to think, does this make sense? Or is there enough information to support this thing that's gonna happen for the reader? I tend to um, try to dig in sort of an exploratory way for myself. And then hopefully at the end, um, at the end of all of that, uh, it will it will be evocative to another human. Well, the book was described in a review as it's a pity the beast was. It's a book that makes evil so natural. And when I heard that quote, I thought of Cormac McCarthy. Mm -hmm. So, who do you find at other writers that produce like beautiful evil? Well, I think he does for sure. Um, uh, I'm thinking, um, oh, the book, oh gosh, I'm blanking on the name of the author, um, uh, Ceremony, um, who wrote Ceremony? Um, can you look that one up? Well, um, get uh, I mean, I think Annie Prue does, I think Faulkner does, um, I think, Jam Coetzee does. I think Claire V. Watkins does. Um, I mean, I think in some ways uh, there's a lot of writers out there. I'm I'm particularly interested in evil. I'm interested in why people do bad things, um, and oftentimes unaware of it. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I th people have said. Um, that my stuff like talk that particular review talks about my this book in relation to Cormac McCarthy and that I'm influenced by Cormac McCarthy, which I guess I obviously am. I love his work. I'm I'm so fascinated by his work. But what I think that he is influenced by is the West. I think he is influenced by the West. So if you allow yourself to be influenced by the West in that way, um, you're gonna have a commonality, and people are gonna say, "Oh, you're writing like him," or he's like you know, but the West has certain elements in it. And a, a lot of it is quite dark. And a lot of it is, you know, death is right there on, on the ground. Um, uh, do you want me to look that up? God, what's her name? Oh, it's okay. in uh, Leslie's Silco. Marvin Silco. Like, I don't know if you know that book ceremony, but her work is amazing. But that book is is wild and super dark and Western. And you see a lot of these um very she's she's a very very important writer for me as well as mccarthy and uh a million others too i'll try to phrase this next question so i don't sound like captain obvious so uh you wrote a western while you were out west so which came first you you want to you desire to write a western or were you just like totally influenced by your location or it just didn't matter well okay so I finished Reptile House that you know about that my first collection and then I started a new story, you know, you finish your collection so you start another one. And um, the beginning part of this book so where people call it the the set piece or the initiating event which is a really long scene about 50 pages long was was my first short story that I wrote after Reptile House. And I kind of left it over to the side, but it was, it was, it came from a story of some friends in Alaska who there was this horse that got impregnated by this big horse from the farm next door. And all these people had come over to help with the, this troubled labor. So I wrote that story. And um, when I decided to expand this one into a novel, so I wrote that one, I, I think it was actually in, my, in New Hampshire when I wrote that. Um, but it came from Alaska. And then I was in Montana for a while. So some of the dialogue 
at towards the end came straight from a weird bonfire at a KOA campground in Dillon, Montana. I just ran in and wrote it down. <laughs> um, but I decided to move it from Alaska to the lower 48 states like Northern Rockies because I felt like it gave me more access to horses because if I wanted to go into the mountains in this chase, you can't really do that in Alaska. It's just impossible. You, there's mountains are too rugged for horse travel and people just rarely do it. So I just moved it to the West, meaning not Alaska out of, you know, tinkering the, what we do, how you have to shape the story. And then, then I moved to the West because I felt like it would be a pretty good place for me to, cause I, I'm a short, I was a short fiction writer. I thought of myself only as a short fiction writer and this expanding to the size was, uh, really scary and perplexing for me so I moved west because I was like all right that I'll just I like the west too I like it out here and you know there's just cowboys walking around and you can ask them stuff and there's there's a lot of um there's a lot of material and it's real interesting so well, you you describe your character Saul as like this John Wayne character and as we all know John Wayne is going to be like I'm going to I'm going to kiss the woman if whether she likes it or not. I'm going to punch the man whether he likes it or not. How much joy did you have kind of knocking down like that whole mythology of like the masculine cowboy? I had a lot of fun with that. I mean, I I mean, the it's just a, a stereotype that was waiting is waiting to be knocked down. And um and then people have asked me about the women in the book, you know, Granny or Ginny or her sister Ella. And Ginny, Granny especially is really, really tough. And was, they'll ask me if Granny was hard to write. And I say, no, because there are so many tough women and there always have been in these everywhere. I mean, people who come into these hard places to live, the women have to be super smart, super tough, very strong. And, um, and, and so I think I, I like Saul, like he's bad. He just bad stuff. I like all my characters. So I, I, you know, you have to, for me, the challenge was they do bad things in the book. And the, the challenge was for me just to not let them be, be so bad that they seemed insane or something like that, or un, unrecognizable and, um, but definitely challenging the the stereotype that exists. <laughs> Did you, are you familiar with the TV version of Fargo with the the rough cow cowboy women, the Swanee, and I forget what the sidekick was. But as the way you're describing your character, it seems very similar. I'm not. I I know the movie Fargo, but I've been without TV reception for so long that I'm just catching up on a lot of that stuff. But um, yeah, it's a common, there's, there's just badasses all over the place. Like with Ginny, if you get into the book, she goes, she has a backpack full of stuff. And in order to fill her backpack, I have a friend who's this woman who's sort of a calamity Jane of now, for real. She's a mountain lion hunter and she runs big equipment at a big gold mine. And she was a wilderness guide, a, a hunting guide. And I just, one day I said, Hey, can you show me what's in your backpack? And we just went through her backpack and there was all this stuff. <laughs> and, and so you, you know, it was, it was good for research to be in a place like that, like this. Yeah. Try that in Boston and the pepper spray would come out of the backpack <laughs> and that would be the end of that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. The um, question from John. Uh, so you, you started the, you've expanded a short story to write this book. So how did you fill the pages in the middle, like the progression of that? Well, I, I, the story, even though it's a pretty wild story, um, the, the central story or the backbone or people call it the clothesline is quite simple. Like it's this chase story, it's a hunt, a chase, a uh, search. And so um, I, I followed it and, and just let it fill along the sides all the way back. And then you revise and fill and cut. Um, I was pretty afraid of that, but um, 
it's it wasn't it wasn't a problem to fill to fill it. I think when you're coming from a short fiction mentality or practice, you know, you want a, your your work to be as tight and as tight as possible, like not one extra word. And so having a little bit of flesh on the bones was very uncomfortable for me. But um yeah, it filled in. And, you know, like there's mules that talk in the book and there's digressions off into various uh, um, sort of uh, what I call thought thought islands that repeat through the book. And um, I allowed myself that stuff and, and hoped very much that I would find a publisher that would allow for me to play in that way because I had a lot of fun with that. No. We talked about filling it out. Did you work toward an ending that you already kind of knew about in your head, or did you just the ending just kind of happened as you were going? Did it? Did the book lead itself? I guess is the question. I mean, I I just knew what was going to happen at the end. I knew it was going to happen at the end, but I didn't really worry about it. I just took the steps. Like it's a big camping trip, and you know this camp, that camp, you know this chase, that chase. Um, and in some ways, I feel like because I sort of had this simple storyline in the middle, which with a very traditional kind of ending, you know, I have a friend who was getting his PhD at UMass Amherst studying the Western fil in film. And I said, like, because I'm not a huge fan of the Western, a lot of them are kind of boring to me. But I said to this friend, what do I need? You know, you need a chase, you need a bunch of horses, you need a gunfight. Like, so, you know, you put those in. and they're pretty fun to have a book where you get to have horses and mules and mountains and rock slides. And, um, you know, I've written space stories and city stories, but it was really fun. Um, and it just allows a lot of things. And I, I, uh, one of my favorite writers who's a mentor of mine named Jim Shepard, he says that I am an intuitive writer where I just allow myself to go places where I don't know exactly why I'm going there. I have an extra high tolerance for that. Um, there he is. Someone says Jim Shepard. Um, but uh, yeah, so I just allowed, a, and it's, a, it's an uncomfortable way to write because you feel lost sometimes, which I felt lost a lot of the times, but the characters were lost. So we were on the same page kind of. So do you feel Pity the Beast, is there any interest in making it into a movie? It sounds like it'd be a great film. I would, I, you you set me up, do you know anyone? I mean, I, I've got an agent and she's, I know she would like that. I was, I would like it, but you know, somebody has to get Jane Campion to call us up or something. <laughs> um, so uh, you're, work is described as very dark. Now, without giving away the novel, if it, the answer happens to be within the novel, I don't want you to give it away, but what do you think the darkest situation or event in any of your writings, including your short stories, what do you think that was? Um, well, actually, I think uh, there's a lot of dark in this coming story collection that's coming out in October. Um, this this book, I, I I write what I write, so I don't tend to think of it as really dark. People tell me that it's really dark. I think the world has, if you look at what's going on in the world, you look at what's happening, um, and if you actually take it seriously and write about it, then, I mean, then people call it dark. But I mean, if you watch TV shows there's just really w twisted weird things, but it's not really taken seriously. It's uh, just some somebody gets killed or somebody gets hacked to pieces by a oh, murderer and then you just go on. And I think what, what I do in my work is I, I'm interested in why people do that stuff. So I look at it quite closely and that is I think why people call it dark, but I just think that I'm looking at what's there um, because that's, what mystifies me about our world right now. I'm mystified by our world. And so, you know, there's a, there's a rape in this, the, in this book that is, takes about two and a half pages. And a lot of people, you know, will stop 
at that point. I mean, I don't know how many, but like it's, it's freaks them out, but there's so much more in the book after page 47 or something like that. Um, there's a, there's a story in my first collection called, um, the natural history of Carlsbad caverns. And there's a, that I, I heard a story of a friend of mine whose father was murdered. He was kidnapped um, and murdered. He was a, and, and I just wrote that story because I kept thinking about this friend who had grown up without a dad. Um, and that's a really, really hard story, <laughs> but I'm only interested in that kind of stuff. So, but I just think I write what I see and what, what freaks me out or bothers me. Now, do you have a certain, this is the last question here, do you have a certain way that you arrange a collection of short stories? Do you have a, a formula at all or? A... So I often imagine it as like a musician's set list. You know, we'll start with the fast songs and we'll end with the encore and blah, blah, blah. So as a writer, do you do that? Yeah, I mean, you have to, you have to arrange it some way. I mean, and I always get irritated when I see people reading a poetry collection or short fiction collection where they're just jumping around and I say, or they start with the shortest story. I always like, don't you know that the writer has put these in here for you in a particular order? Um, I mean, what, what I remember hearing one time is that the first story, the third story and the last story are what you have to really nail down. Um, it's sort of like batting order or like a playlist or a album. Um, you have to really grab the reader on the first one. Then like the second one has to be good too. And then you got to hit it really hard on the third one. And then the last one has to be great. And, and then in between you have to maybe thematically uh, place the stories sort of slow it down, you know, back it off a little bit, put the really long one second to last or at the end, that kind of stuff. But um, I mean, you got to knock it out of the park on the first one, <laughs> pretty much, I think. All right. Well, Robin, I want to thank you so much for being with us and uh, telling us so much about writing and your process and hearing from uh, you read from your book. And for folks that want to see what it looks like. And Robin is very strongly advocates for uh, independent bookstores and bookshop.com. So uh, definitely take a look at that. And uh, more independent bookstores, much less Elon Musk type. Yeah. Of book. Yeah. I think I'm going to be at um, Porter Square Books on October 18th with my collection. And if anybody's in Boston, they should come on over. <laughs> I love Porter Square books, so. Yeah. It'd be wonderful. Well, thank you again. And folks that are watching the stream of this on Facebook, there's an open mic. You can use the Zoom link to join us. Otherwise, I'm gonna cut you off. So uh, thank you very much for watching. And uh, Robin, thank you again. Thank you, Tim. It's been really fun and maybe see you in Boston soon. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming.